Pastor Appreciation Week and a half because by the time I'm done, you're going to really <laughs> appreciate your pastor <laughs> and be glad that he's back. Colossians chapter number four, verse number seven. <clears throat> All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose that I might know your estate and comfort your hearts with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. They shall make known unto you all things which are done here. We'll go ahead and pray together and jump into this verse. Lord, thank you for this evening. Thank you for all these folks that decided to come out on a Wednesday. What a blessing to see such a good crowd on, on a Wednesday night. Lord, we ask and pray that you'd be with us this evening. There's absolutely nothing that can be said or done in the power of flesh, that can be said or done by man alone, that could accomplish anything spiritual this evening. So, Lord, we do ask and pray that you'd be with us, that you'd help us, Lord, that you'd be with me as I try to preach, that you'd be with the congregation as we try to listen, as we try to learn, as we try to apply these words to our lives. Lord, we thank you more than anything for coming to this earth and dying on the cross for filthy old sinners like us, for making a way of salvation, that we go to heaven when we die. Lord, we're so, so eternally thankful for that. And Lord, we just ask that you'd be with us and bless us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Colossians chapter 4, verse 7. We're going to talk about this, e uh, this evening, this, this word in this verse, minister. The fact that Tychicus was a faithful minister. We talked about the fact that he was faithful last time, Sunday, uh, Wednesday evening, if you remember that. And now we're going to talk about, more specifically, the Bible says he was a faithful minister. So we're going to study what the Bible says about ministers and what the Bible says about ministering and what we find might surprise you. When most people, lost or worldly people, hear the word minister, what do they think of? They think of, they think of some guy in that little black suit and that little white collar saying a bunch of fancy words and nice words and being real sweet. And that's what, that's what they think a minister is. You wouldn't believe if you go to Bible college or Bible institute and you try to explain people what you're doing with your life. They say, oh, so you're training to be a minister. Uh, maybe, I, I guess. What, uh, what do you mean by minister? And that's what most worldly or lost people mean by the word minister. And that's obviously not biblical. And when most Christians think of a minister, they think of a pastor, they think of a preacher, or somebody who's in the ministry full-time. They think of somebody who's being paid a full-time salary so they can focus on nothing else but the, what we would call the ministry. But what we're going to find in a minute is that that's not exactly biblical either. That's not really what the Bible says about ministering. That's not exactly what the Bible says about a minister. See, in Colossians chapter number 4, we see this man, Tychicus, being called a minister, but see what he's doing. Look again in verse number uh, 6. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how he ought to answer every man. All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. What makes this man a minister? Look at verse number 8 whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that it might know your estate and comfort your hearts. Look at verse 9, end of the verse. They shall make known unto you all things which are done here. So Tychicus in this verse is called a minister, and yet we're given no indication in this verse or any other verse in all the scripture that he was pastoring a church. We're giving no indication in this verse or any other verse that he was receiving any sort of payment for his work. We don't read in Colossians chapter 4 or any other verse in all the Bible what Bible college he graduated from or whether or not he had a degree in, in the ministry, but we do read the fact that he was a minister. We don't read that he was a missionary. We don't read that he went on deputation. We don't read that he ever even did so much as taught a Sunday school lesson. We don't read that the man ever even preached a sermon. And yet the Holy Spirit looks at this man and gives him just a couple words, just a couple qualities, just a couple characteristics. And one of the things he points out is that man is a faithful minister. And so when we use the word minister or the ministry, what do we usually mean? We mean somebody that's serving the Lord on a full-time basis. When we say, that man's a minister, we mean, well, that man's a preacher. That man's a pastor. That man's a missionary. But then we come to this mention of a minister in the Bible, and we don't read of any pastoring. 
We don't read of any missionary work. We read of what? A man being sent by Paul to run errands. A man is called a minister who is simply doing a small task for the apostle Paul. Look, according to the scriptures, being a minister does not mean you have a, a position. Being a minister does not mean you have a particular education. Being a minister doesn't mean you know how to preach or know how to teach. A minister in the Bible, and we're going to look at that in a moment in depth, a minister in the Bible is someone who serves other people. Somebody who ministers to other people. In order to be a minister, you have to minister to other people, and that's not preaching, and that's not teaching, and that's not being large and in charge, and that's not being put over anything or having any sort of recognition. Being a minister in the Bible is simply being a servant to other people. And in that sense of the word minister, everybody in this room is called the full-time ministry. In that sense of the word minister, all of us are called to the ministry what ministry? To serve the Lord and serve other people. Maybe in our minds, maybe in our speech, maybe in our preaching, but we tend to make this unbiblical division and we say there's normal Christians and then there's people that are called to the ministry. We say there's normal Christians and then Christians are supposed to minister to other Christians and that's not true according to the Bible. According to the Bible, we're all called to the ministry. According to the Bible, we're all supposed to serve other people. According to the Bible, we all have been given the ministry of reconciliation. We're all called to preach in a sense. We're all called to told, tell other people about Jesus Christ in a sense. We're all called to serve others. We're all called to the ministry. Tychicus was a minister, and what did we find him doing? We find, we find him delivering a letter to the Colossians from the Apostle Paul and asking how they're doing and Tychicus going back and reporting to the Apostle Paul and the Bible says he's a minister. I want to be a minister. I want to be in the ministry. Great, well, here's a letter. You get on a horse and take it over to that church and then come back and let me know how they're doing. Well, that's not what I meant. I wanted to preach a sermon. I know that's not what you meant, but that's what the ministry is. It's not about getting in front of people. It's not about being in charge. It's not about being important. Sometimes it's about taking a lower place and getting below people so that you might properly serve them. Too many people, and I'm not saying about anybody particularly here, I'm just saying this is rampant in Christianity, particularly our type of Christianity. Too many people say, I'm called to the ministry, and what they mean is they want someone to pay them money to be in charge of other people. And there are plenty of people who are in charge of a ministry but aren't a minister according to the Bible. There are plenty of people who receive a full-time paycheck from a congregation, but according to the Bible, they're in no way, shape, or form a proper biblical minister. And there's plenty of people who have no position and no paycheck and receive no support from anybody, and they are what the Bible would call a biblical minister because they are involved in serving other people. That's exciting because that means it doesn't matter who you are or what you are or who you are or what you do. You can be involved in the ministry because the ministry means serving other people and serving the Lord. So let's take a look at what the Bible says about ministers and ministering. We've got just a couple points, just a couple of verses. I'm not going to promise you that it's going to go quickly. I expect it to go quickly, but we'll see what happens. Exodus chapter number 24. Exodus chapter number 24. First thing I want us to consider is the testimony of Joshua. Testimony of Joshua. This is very, very interesting account. This is the first mention of the word minister, and it's very appropriate because Joshua is one of the best examples of a minister in all the Bible. You search your Bible through and through, and you'll not find a better example of a true biblical minister than Joshua. Now come to Exodus 24, look down at verse number 13. And Moses rose up, and his minister Joshua, and Moses went up unto the mount of God. Like we said, this is the first mention of the word minister in your King James Bible, 
and we read of Joshua. Now, the first mention of the man Joshua is all the way back in Exodus chapter number 17. Well, this is what's interesting. You have Joshua comes in in Exodus 17, and if you read that in Exodus 17, you find Joshua taking commands from Moses. Moses says, hey, I want you to get some men. I want you to fight this battle. And Joshua says, okay. And Joshua gets some men, and he goes and fights the battle. What's he doing? He's ministering. He's serving. He's simply taking directions from somebody else and serving that other person. It's not till Joshua chapter number 1 where we read about Joshua actually taking charge of anything. It's not till Joshua chapter number 1 where we see Joshua being the head of anything. It's not till the first chapter of Joshua that we read about Joshua being any sort of place of leadership or any sort of place of prominence or any sort of really important position at all. It takes many, many chapters and actually many, many books of the Bible before we read of Joshua being in charge of anything. Do you know what that means? From Exodus chapter number 17 all the way to Joshua chapter number 1, Joshua was willing to simply serve in the background without any recognition, without being in charge of anything, without any level of authority, without any sort of, of prominence or leadership or recognition or being lifted up. Joshua, for the vast, vast majority of his life, was satisfied to be in the background underneath Moses, simply being a minister. Do you know what he was? He was Moses' minister. Do you know what he was? He was Moses' servant. He did things for Moses. He did what Moses told him to do. He wasn't in charge. What he said didn't go, didn't go. He didn't have any sort of authority. When something big in the congregation happened, do you know who got the recognition? Moses. When God himself writes the account, do you know who gets the recognition? Moses. Do you know how many times Joshua appears between Exodus chapter 17 and Joshua chapter 1? Very, very few times. Just a handful of verses. And that was, that was upwards of 40 years and there's just a handful of verses about Joshua, and yet he didn't complain. He didn't say, I'm not getting enough recognition. He didn't say, I'm not going to do this if I don't start getting a pay raise. He said, I'm, I'm done with this whole ministering thing if I don't start moving up in the ranks a little bit. Joshua was content with quietly serving in the background for as far as he was concerned the rest of his life. You know, oftentimes we come to the book of Joshua and we read about Joshua taking over the nation and going into the, the Canaan land and, and, and taking over that, that promised land and leading the armies of Israel. And I think that at least I had the, the idea in my mind that he was a young man when he received that, that position. But you know what? If you look at it in the Bible, he was at the very, very least 60 years old because he, was one of, he, was, he went into the promised land and, and came back out and brought the good report. He was one of the two good spies. And then he had to wait 40 years wandering in the wilderness for the rest of the congregation to die off before they could enter the promised land. So that means he was at least 20 at that point because he was, he was, he was an exception to the rule that anybody over 20 would die. So he's at the very least 20, but biblically he's probably more like 80 when he entered the promised land and took over the nation of Israel. You know what that means? For 80 years... He was a servant without leadership, without recognition. Guys, if you're serving the Lord for some sort of recognition, you need to just get your heart right with God. Amen. That's not why we do what we do. That's not why we stand in a pulpit. That's not why we teach a Sunday school class. That's not why we stand on a street corner. That's not why we pray. That's not why we preach. You're not supposed to be serving the Lord for the praise or the recognition of man. Amen. Joshua was willing to stand in the background and do something that was a service and a ministry without anybody ever noticing him or saying anything about it. And he gave the majority of his life to that, 80 long years. If you're only willing to serve the Lord when there's prominence involved, that's not right. That's not right according to the Bible. I don't, know, I don't know why it is, and it's unfortunate, but I'm not saying obviously nobody here because this is actually a very impressive crowd for a Wednesday night. But you say we're having church on a Wednesday night, and more often than not, very, very few people show up, at least percentage-wise to the total amount of people. Is that fair? Okay, percentage-wise, the total amount of people that come to a church, you have 
every, pretty much every church that I know of has a significant drop off in the Wednesday night service. But if you say we're going to have an extremely important business meeting Wednesday where we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna really uh, solve some church matters and we want you to come vote and have a say in the authority and what's going to happen in our church, people come out of the woodwork. People show up from nowhere because they want to have a say in the way things go and they want their voice to be heard and they want to have some authority and they want to have some leadership. That's totally backwards according to the Bible. You have street ministry and, and just a few people show up. You say, I need somebody to teach a Sunday school. I can do it, I can do it. Well, where were you for street ministry? You only serve the Lord when it's something that's important. You only serve the Lord when it's something that I've been called to preach. Well, then why don't, why don't you preach on the street corner? If you're called to preach, why don't you preach door to door? If you're called to preach, why don't you preach? Oh, you meant you're called to a position. You meant you're called to recognition. That's not how Joshua behaved. Joshua was willing to serve and minister in any way that he could, as long as he could satisfied without the recognition. I only say that because, because that's something that's rampant, like we said, in our kind of Christianity. There's lots of people vying for a position or a spot. If you've not seen that, if you've not been familiar with that, praise the Lord for your good fortune. You'll probably see it eventually. People wanting authority, people wanting to be in charge. That wasn't Joshua, and that's not a minister according to the Bible. And I say that because us as humans, our flesh, our pride desires recognition from other people for our work. And the Bible says you're not guaranteed it. Don't look for it. Don't let that be the motivation for what you do. Do you know what's going to almost certainly happen? Missions conference. Missions conference. Well, it's two months away. Exact, just about exactly two months. Maybe a day less than two months. Missions conference. Do you know what's going to happen at mission conference? Absolutely, probably, certainly. I'm, I'm going to... Predict the future right now. After missions conference, preacher's going to get up here and he's going to say, thank you so much, Brother Ron, for preaching such a wonderful sermon. You're such a blessing to our church. We really appreciate you and everything you do for us and everything we do for, you do for all the other churches and for Christians. You, you, you've helped our church so much and we're going to send him off with a love offering to show him how much we appreciate him. Do you know what's not going to happen after missions conference? We're not going to say, thank you so much, brother so-and-so, for taking out the trash every single night after the meal. That was such a blessing. We appreciate you so much. You're such a blessing to our church and everybody else's church. Here's a love offering for taking out the trash. We're not saying we don't appreciate the person who takes out the trash. We absolutely appreciate that service, and we'd notice if it didn't get done. We're not saying we don't appreciate the people that do the little things, but the preaching and the service... That receives some recognition. The preaching and the, the ministering of the word of God, people tend to recognize that and say, wow, that was really good, thank you. People don't tend to give you recognition for taking out the trash, but you know what? They're both a ministry. They're both a way of serving other people. And the Bible says if you're not willing to take out the trash, you're not fit to preach the sermon. You know what's not going to happen? You know, you know, if, you get in this, if you get in this pulpit, you know what's going to happen? You're going to preach a sermon. And you're going to have, for the most part, everybody's intention in the room. And everyone's going to listen. Everyone's going to nod their head. And they're going to say, praise the Lord. And even if you preach bad, they're going to come by afterwards. And they're going to shake your hand. And they say, I really, really appreciate that. That was a blessing. Thank you so much. And they go, and, and, and. Then we're going to videotape the whole thing. And we're going to put you a YouTube star. And there's going to be a bunch of people clicking the little like button on your YouTube and say, wow, what a great sermon. That was so great. Do you know what we're not going to do? We're not going to videotape you mowing the grass or scrubbing the toilet and put it on YouTube so you can get likes. You're not, we're not going to say, brother so-and-so mowed the grass. We're going to have him stand in the back and you shake his hand on a good mowing, brother. Good mowing. We appreciate those straight lines. That was a blessing. It's not going to happen. It's not that we don't appreciate the grass mowing. We surely do. It's not that we don't appreciate the toilet scrubbing. We absolutely appreciate that. And that is what we're trying to say is one of those ministries has a certain level of recognition involved with it. The other one of those ministries has very, very little public recognition involved with it, but they are both ministries. And they're both ways that you can serve the brethren. And they're both ways that you can help other people and serve other people and be a blessing to man and being a blessing to God. 
And according to the scripture, if you're not willing to mow the grass and scrub the toilet because those aren't important enough to you, you're not fit to preach a sermon. You're not fit to be in a pulpit. And personally, and I know for a fact Brother Tim feels the same way, I wouldn't want anybody in this pulpit who's not willing to scrub a toilet or mow the grass. Because if you're going to be a minister, if you're going to minister, what you're supposed to do when you get in a pulpit is you're supposed to minister to other people. You're supposed to serve. The word minister, it means serve. We're going to show you that in a second. We're getting ahead of ourselves, but we're going to go with it anyway. You're supposed to serve other people when you minister to other people. So when you get in this pulpit, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about Pastor Tim. When I get in this pulpit and I teach a sermon, my goal ought to be I'm trying to be a servant to you. I'm trying to help you. You know what we have? Street ministry. When you go to street ministry, do you know what the goal is? Not to be a smart aleck, not to win an argument, not to be a big, mean street preacher. The goal of the street minister is to minister to the lost people that are out there. Now, that's not to say that they're going to enjoy your message. That's not going to say we, re we really appreciate that service that you gave us when you told us that we needed Jesus, otherwise we're going to go to hell. And when you gave us a gospel tract, and they're not necessarily going to appreciate it, but your goal when you're out on the street is to minister to other people. I know what it's like to get in a pulpit and teach and the thoughts that go through your brain and, and you want it to be good and you want it to sound smooth and you want it to be, obviously you want it to be biblical and you've got time constraints and you don't want it to be too long but you certainly don't want to go way too short and you're all worried about all those different things and those things are important and yeah, keep those things in mind but don't ever miss that the main goal is to serve other people and if the sermon's perfect and if the illustration's spot on and if your time's perfect and you got people crying at the altar but your heart's not to serve other people you're not a minister according to the bible and so when you look at that definition of the word minister it's not about getting recognition for what you do it's about helping other people this what i'm doing is one way to try to help other people there's a thousand different ways you can try to help other people in the church house, each and every church service, and in between each and every other church service. There's plenty of things you can do to try to minister and be a blessing to other people. <clears throat> Let me show you this. Come to Exodus 33. I am suspicious of somebody who says that they want to be in the ministry someday but spends zero amount of time ministering to other people right now. You would think if you were called to the ministry, then even before you got to the mission field or even before you got a position in a church, you would be busy being a minister. You would think if God put it in your life and put it on your heart to be a minister in the ministry, then it wouldn't, you, you couldn't help but do anything you could to be a servant, a blessing, a minister to other people. But far too often we have people that say, I've been called to the ministry, and what they mean is I want to be in charge of you. What they mean is I want to be able to say that I'm something important because I claim to have this call upon my life. That's not biblical. <laughs> Biblically, if you're a minister, then you're going to be involved in ministering to people. And if you look at the definition of ministering to people, it's got nothing to do with being in charge of people and everything to do with serving other people. We'll see that here at Exodus 33. Look at verse number 11. Now, what did, what did Exodus 24 call Joshua? Moses, minister. What's it say here in Exodus 33, verse 11? The Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend, and he turned again unto the camp but his servant, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. So Exodus chapter number 24 calls Joshua a minister of Moses. But Exodus chapter number 33 calls Joshua the servant of Moses. Why are those two words used interchangeably in these chapters? Because those two words mean the same thing. 
You're going to minister to somebody, then you are going to serve somebody. Like we said, your street ministry, your Sunday school lesson, whatever it is you do in the church that is a ministry ought to be a service to other people in your mind, in your heart, and in your actions. Come to Matthew chapter number 20. Matthew chapter number 20. Matthew chapter 20. Look at uh, verse number 25, Matthew 20, 25. But Jesus called unto them, uh, called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, Let him be your servant, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. You know what Jesus says in this passage? He says, if you go out to the Gentiles, if you go out to the world, if you go out to the kingdoms of the world, you're going to see people who are attempting to exercise dominion over each other. You're going to find people that are trying to be in charge. You're going to find people that are trying their best to be the head honcho, people that are are clawing and fighting and kicking and stabbing to work their way to the position where they're in charge of other people. Because out there in the world, if you're higher up, that means you're in charge. If you have authority, that means you're great. The way to be great is to get as high as you can over other people and be ruler over them. That's how the Gentiles think. That's what the world says. But you know what Jesus said? It shall not so be among you. If you want to be great among Christians, then what you need to do is be a servant. If you want to be great among Christians, do you know what you need to do? You need to get down as low as you can and minister to other people. And then he gives the perfect example himself and says, I left heaven itself. I left what was literally the most lofty position anybody could ever hold. And then I came down to this earth and became a man, but I didn't come down to this earth and become the king of men. I came down to this earth and became the lowest of men. I came down to this earth and I took the sin of all mankind in my body and then I went to a cross and I suffered and I died at the hands of the most wicked, deplorable, nasty men you could ever imagine at no fault of my own. Not one time did I ever deserve it and I went to that cross and I died and I gave my life a ransom for many and Jesus points to that and says that's what I mean when I say if you want to be great, get low. That's what I mean. If you want to be great among your brethren, be a servant. You say, I can't, I can't be a servant to other people. Why, I'm very, very important, and I've got so much Bible, more Bible knowledge than Jesus. I'm very important, and you see, to take out the trash would be something that's far below me. Well, Jesus came to this earth and, and was worse than trash. He went to the cross and took the sins of all mankind upon him. And he was certainly had a better position than you. He was certainly more prestigious and more lofty than you. If Jesus Christ could come to this earth and minister to, to, to sick creatures like us in that way, why are we too proud to serve other people? Come to uh, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter number 2. Philippians 2, look at verse number 25. Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants... Ministered to my wants. You know what the Bible says about Epaphroditus concerning Paul? That this man was a minister to the Apostle Paul 
in this way in particular, he provided to Paul some things that Paul wanted. He said, Paul, what would you like? And Paul said, well, I really need. And he said, no, 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 no. Not what do you need. What do you want? What would make you more happy? What would just bring you a little bit of comfort? What's something that might not be a necessity, but, but if I can get it for you, I'll get it for you. If I can do it for you, I'll do it for you. Let me be a minister. Yeah, I'll get what you need. I'll get your necessities. But too many people are just giving you what you need, Paul. I want to make sure you have what you want, too. Do you know you could be a minister to other people in a way that's not necessarily super spiritual? We say be a minister to people around you. We're not talking about sitting down and saying, hey, what's something I can pray with you about? You can do that. That'd be great. Do that. But you know what else you can do? You could say, hey, I, I, could, I could tell you needed this. Or we were talking and you said one day you wanted to get that. So I just thought I'd get it for you. You know, you were talking how you really like such and such for dinner. And, and we made some and we want to have your family over. You know what that is? That's a blessing. And that's a ministry. And the Bible says that's a way that you can serve other people. <clears throat> Some of the biggest blessings that people have done for me personally are things that I didn't need. Would you say that's true in your life too? Some of the most thoughtful things that people have done for you is something that you could have done without, but they saw you had a need or they heard you say you wanted something and they just said, well, let me do that for them. And there's no, nothing like that that is so thoughtful and so touching that really helps you know that people care about you and love you and, and, and care for you. And it's a way to serve people, a way to minister to people. Paphroditus did that to Paul. And what a blessing that is. So we're not necessarily talking about things that would be considered spiritual, per se. We're talking about also, in addition to those things that would be considered spiritual, just helping somebody, being a blessing to somebody, taking out the trash, Mowing the grass, cleaning the bathroom, seeing what you could do after, after the fellowship to help clean up. Those are ways you can be a minister, and they're just as important as any other ministry. Keep reading about this man. This man is incredible. Somebody you should aspire to be like. Look at verse 26. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. So get this, Epaphroditus was full of heaviness and sorrow and longed after those people, not because Epaphroditus was sick, but because Epaphroditus heard that the Philippians heard that Epaphroditus was sick. And Epaphroditus was worried because the Philippians heard that he was sick, that they would be sad that he was sick. So he was sad because they might be sad. He wasn't worried about his own sickness. He was upset because they heard about his sickness and he didn't want to cause them any trouble. That was the kind of man, the kind of minister, the kind of servant that Epaphroditus was. Look at verse number 27. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him and not on him only, but on me also lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the more carefully that when you see him again, you may rejoice that I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness. Hold such in reputation. Look at verse 30. Because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. You know what Paul told the Philippians? He said, you heard he was sick and he was worried not because he was sick, but because he didn't want to cause you any problems. And you're right, he was sick. In fact, he was so sick, he almost died. And the reason he was sick is because he was so busy serving Christ and serving me, trying to make up for your lack of service that he didn't even regard his own life. He worked himself to the bone, quite literally worked himself to death trying to serve Paul and serve Jesus Christ. Two perspectives I want to give you on this. One, don't be the Philippians who are forcing other people to work triple overtime to make up for your lack of service, to force other people to work themselves to death because you won't do what you're supposed to do. I'm not accusing you of that, but I'm saying that's where the Philippians were, and Paul kind of slides that in there. Yeah, he almost died because of your lack of service towards me. You didn't do something for me that you should have done, and so he almost killed himself trying to make up. Now, here's the second thing I want to uh, have you consider. A true servant, a true minister, requires that you make a sacrifice. If you 
are going to serve other people, you are going to have to be willing to sacrifice for other people. You cannot properly minister to other people if your attitude is, I'm only going to go as far as con is convenient. You can't properly minister to other people if your attitude is, I'll help those other people so long as it's easy for me, so long as it fits into my predetermined daily schedule, so long as I have the extra finances, so long as, as it doesn't cause any troubles for me, then okay, fine, I'll help them. But as soon as it starts to get into my little comfort zone, well, no, I can't, I can't help you anymore because if I help you more, it's going to hurt me. That's a lot of people's attitudes. They're willing to minister to other people so long as it doesn't inconvenience them. Epaphroditus was willing to die because he was trying to serve the apostle Paul. You know what? If you're going to be a servant, you're going to have to do some things you don't want to do. I don't want to scrub the toilet. Who does? I don't want to work in the nursery. Nobody wants to work in the nursery. But you know what that is? It's a ministry. That is a way that you can serve people and serve your congregation and be a blessing to the people of God. Just as important as any other ministry. You can do it with a good attitude or you can do it with a poor attitude. You can do it when it's convenient to you or you can do it when it's inconvenient to you. And that applies to any other service for other people and for the Lord. You're only going to do it when it's easy or you're going to be like Epaphroditus and work yourself near to death trying to be a minister to the Lord and be a minister to other people. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. We're almost done. Just a few more verses. Ephesians chapter number 4. <laughs> Ephesians 4. Now, oh, we don't have time to look at it in depth. Well, I hope you're somewhat familiar with it. We've talked about it before. If, we're, if we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, the Bible discusses the body of Jesus Christ. And it's talking about the spiritual body in which we all have a part when you're saved. When you're spiritually baptized, I mean, you trust Jesus Christ, you're given the Holy Spirit, you're put into the body of Christ, and the Bible says you're a part of that body. The Bible says we all have different parts in that body. Some of us are a heart, some of us are a pinky toe, but we all have a part in that body, whether it be big or small, and if that part of our body is not functioning, it hurts the rest of the body. Now, the Bible says when you've been given that Holy Spirit and when you've been put into that body of Christ, the, that God, the Holy Spirit, has given unto you some certain and particular spiritual gifts that you possess, and the reason that he gave you those gifts are so that you could minister to other people. That's Ephesians 4. Look at Ephesians 4, verse number uh, 11. Uh, no, back up. Uh, verse 8. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended upon high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. That's those spiritual gifts talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now that he ascended, what is, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above the heavens, that he might find, uh, he might fill all things. Look at verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why? Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come into the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The Bible says when, when the Holy Spirit came into your heart, he gave you certain spiritual gifts. He gave you abilities that I don't have. He gave me abilities that you don't have. And I need your ability and you, and, and you need my ability if we're going to function properly as a body. The Bible says the reason he gave you what he gave you spiritually is so that you can work in the ministry. So you can serve and edify other people. Listen, Every single, this is why it's so sad, such a sad thing when a Christian is, is carnal and they won't get involved and they won't get in and do what they're supposed to do because you have something I need and I have something you need and you have something the rest of this congregation absolutely needs and we can't get it unless you get in and get involved and do everything you're supposed to do. You've been given a gift by the Holy Spirit to minister to the body of Christ. 
The reason you've been given that is so that you can help other people. Look at Romans chapter number 12. It's not right. It's not really fair if you, if you hog that thing to yourself. We need it. Romans chapter 12, verse, if all you do is come and sit in a pew and be ministered unto but never minister to anyone else, you're really crippling the body of Christ. You've got, you've got a kidney that's not functioning properly. We've got a heart that's not functioning properly. We've got a, a part of the brain that's not functioning properly. We've we got a, a missing uh, an arm that's not working correctly. That's somebody that just comes and doesn't minister like they're supposed to minister. Your heart stops pumping blood. It's still there. It's still sitting in your chest every Sunday and every Sunday night and every Wednesday. Your heart's in your chest, but it's not pumping any blood. You've got a big problem. Every Sunday, every Sunday night, every Wednesday, a church member's sitting in a pew, but it's not ministering like he's supposed to, like she's supposed to. You've got a problem. That applies to every member of the body of Christ sitting in a pew, standing in a pulpit. Romans chapter 12, really quick, almost done here. Romans chapter 12, look at verse number <clears throat> one. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. I have a hand, I have a foot. They have two entirely different offices, but they're both members of the same body. Make sense? That's how the Bible says about the Christians. We have me, we have Brother George, we have Brother TJ, we have Brother Michael. We're not the same, we're different, we're different people, we have different functions, but we're all part of the same body, and we all work to make that body work like it's supposed to be. Look at verse number six. Having then gifts differing, According to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the uh, proportion, proportion, sorry, I don't know why that word is stuck in my, proportion of faith, or I know how to read, I just need to sound it out. (laughs) Sound it out, Kyle. (laughs) Proportion. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. The Bible says whatever it is that God has given for you to do, do it and do it for the edification of the rest of the body. Okay, that is your job as a Christian, to be a minister, to be a servant in any way you possibly can to other Christians. So here's the question that we'll, we'll end with. Did you serve anybody last week? Did you, did you, were you on the lookout for opportunities to be a minister or a servant to other people? You say, oh, I didn't think to do that. I think that's our problem. I don't think that we hate other people. I think we're so self-centered that we don't think to do other things for other people. We don't think to minister to other people. So that's not an excuse. It's the very root of the issue. I didn't think to. is a big issue. Have you been on the lookout to be a minister? Have you done any searching time with the Lord to try to determine what you can do spiritually? What, if you have the Holy Spirit, you have a spiritual gift. That's what the Bible says. Have you done anything to try to figure out what that is and then utilize that to the help and the blessing of other people? If not, why not? And if not, how about we start now? The vast majority of references to the word minister in the Bible, and we'll just end, we'll just say this really quickly, we won't even look at, there, there's a ton of references in the Old Testament, and the vast majority of them are references to priests ministering unto the Lord in the tabernacle. You know what we need to do as Christians? We need to minister one to another. We also need to minister unto the Lord. We need to be full-time ministry, not preaching in a pulpit, but serving the Lord in any way, shape, or form, or capacity that he would have us to do. What does a servant do? He does what his master tells him to. You've got a book full of instructions, and you have an open communication of prayer with God. Let's be servants and ministers to the Lord. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you.